happy Friday, everyone. Such a treat to have you all here. Thank you so much for joining us for our April Lunch and Learn session for Westpac's Ruby Connection. I'm going to hand it over to the brilliant Amber to do our official introduction to today's session before we jump into all things Investing 101. Thank you, Maggie. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Um, my name is Amber Joyce, and I have the privilege of being part of the Ruby Connection team here at Westpac. Before we dive in today, however, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners of this beautiful land in which we are all meeting on, wherever you, where you, wherever you may be sitting. For me, that is on the land of the Daral people, and I would like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. These sessions, are, these sessions and the community that we are building through these events are going from strength to strength and I want to thank everyone for their support and welcome anyone new who's joining us today. For those that don't know, Ruby is an online community where we get to continue conversations about the issues that women are talking about while building confidence across all generations and ultimately helping to pave the way for a stronger, better future for all women. Whether you're starting your financial journey, establishing a family, you're interested in investing or winding down towards retirement, Ruby is an empowering and welcoming place to share and learn. I am particularly excited about this session today as we get to focus on debunking some investing myths and getting more comfortable with options to invest while building our future wealth. I know there's going to be so many takeaways that we can take out to our networks, friends and women alike to help boost our financial confidence. So thank you again for your time today. And without further ado, I'd like to throw it back to you, Maggie. Thank you so much, Amber, and welcome to those of you joining us for today's Ruby Connection Westpac series on Investing 101. Welcome. We would love to hear where are you joining us from today? Let me know in the chat and a shout out to anyone who's from my hometown of the Gold Coast. And Molly, I know that's where you're from originally too. Uh, so welcome to any Queenslanders joining us today. Uh, today's session is going to be fascinating. If you have questions about investing, if you have fears about investing, if you've had successes that you'd like to share, let us know in the chat. We would love to hear from you. We've got half an hour together today. The time is going to go super quickly because we've got these wonderful panelists joining us today. It is a delight to introduce to you Louise, Molly and Julia. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, Julia Lee is the Founder and Chief Investment Officer at Berman Invest. Uh, you probably recognize her from multiple, multiple, multiple media appearances over the years and she has more than 20 years of experience in financial markets. Julia, quick pop quiz. What's a fun fact about you and investing from your past? Uh, I remember when I first started investing and um, someone told me that, you know, go with the names you know and trust. And for anyone starting on their investment journey, sometimes the most difficult thing to do is choose the share or business or investment that you're going to first invest in. So I kind of thought about it and I thought I was out of uni, I was drinking a lot of wine and I was probably contributing to the profitability of a lot of wine companies. So I found a company called South Corp and I put $500 into South Corp because that's a minimum investment on the ASX. In a month, my $500 had become $1,000 and I thought, oh, this is easy, let's give it another shot. So I sold South Corp and then I had a look at all the list of companies on the market and I found the one called North Limited and I thought, I want my investments to go north, not south. So let's try this one. I put my money into North Limited. It got taken over a couple of weeks later and I doubled my money to $2,000. And I thought, this is easy. I'll give it another shot. So I'm looking through the companies on the ASX and there was one called Julia Mines. Um, I thought, my name's Julia, no brainer. Put the $2,000 in there. Julia <laughs> Mines, you're in the middle of the tech boom, became Julia Limited and I doubled my money again. I think the point of this story is that there are times when it's really easy to invest in the market and then there are times that uh, where it's a lot more difficult. And I obviously started it at a boom time, but now I look at different factors out there and I'm a big fan of looking at cycles in the market and um, whether we're in an easy cycle or a difficult cycle. Interesting, Julia. So this is fascinating. And may all of your investing journeys be as successful as Julia's. We will talk about the fact that that unfortunately is not always the case. And I should 
preface today's conversation with the fact that this is not investment advice. We are here to have a general conversation about investing, the principles behind it. Of course, you should always consult with professionals if you are looking to make investments uh, for you and your family. We will talk about that a little further. Louise, it is a delight to have you with us today. I know that a big part of the work that you do as a financial advisor with Shoring Partners is really about supporting families. And you're often seen as like the CFO of a family unit. And we're going to hear more about your work in a second, but I know you've got a very interesting um, investment story, which is actually quite different to Julia's. It is very different because I've been in financial services for 21 years. So I started in 2001 and I was pretty green because I was a radiographer one month before I started in investment services and I did a crash course and I became an investment advisor. I did DFP1, which was the minimum requirement that you needed to do to be an authorised representative. And I was unleashed on the world to give financial advice. And the first time I placed an investment was September 11, 2001. And that night, we all know what happened. And so it was pretty, um, you know, it was really quite an um, interesting experience and one that, you know, has stayed with me for my time in financial services. So it's, um, yeah, it's not always the case that you uh, double your money overnight. I wish it was. I wish it was, Louise, because we'd all be retired living on yachts in the middle of Bermuda if that was the case. But we're going to talk a little bit more about what you can do when you're first starting to invest. Um, and Molly, last but by no means least, um, I'm excited to hear your uh, investment story and a fun fact about you, because you openly talk about the fact that you weren't very good with money, even though you spent a lot of your career working for huge financial institutions, including Barclays, the Bank of Queensland and places like that. But it wasn't something that you were comfortable with. And I can really relate to this because I remember being at college asking my guy friends at college what they were always doing on their computers I knew they weren't studying and they were trading so they had to kind of teach me because I didn't know that inherently but Molly I'm interested to know like what's the genesis of your investing story well do you know what Maggie um my first investing story was really I was investing in hashtag good times my wardrobe and experiences <laughs> I was not I was not investing at all um and it's, it's something okay. that you know Taking the more I learn off. A little bit of it Mickey. is oh, there's a little bit of um regret there um but yeah it wasn't i didn't start my investing journey till a little bit um later in life um which i, I can talk about uh, um later on but yeah i definitely say i was in that category of like i didn't know what investing was i didn't know how to get started it was it was a different world for me and I'm, I want to hear from everyone in the chat. Shout out to anyone else who's an expert at being a good times investor. I feel like, <laughs> Molly, a lot of people will relate to that. Um, perhaps you've invested in, you know, your wardrobe, maybe your furniture at home, um, but perhaps your share portfolio uh, may not be as robust. So let's, let's jump into having a really serious conversation about this, right? Because a lot of us, to your point, Molly, um, and I appreciate you sharing your story, you know, you talk openly with the work that you do at Ladies Finance Club about how you used to see yourself as clueless when it came to investing. You're now somewhat of an expert and you've got a community of thousands of women around the world. So we're going to talk about that. But Julia, for people who are like, look, I've got a decent job, you know, I'm able to save a little bit of money. I should be doing something with it other than popping it in the bank. Where do they start, Julia? Because like sometimes it's overwhelming to think like it's too intimidating. I don't know what to buy. I don't know if I'm going to be as successful as Julia and double my money. What if I lose it? What would you say to people who are just a bit apprehensive today? Oh, I guess when you start investing, people tend to do one of three things. One, they do everything. So, um, you know, they can't make a decision, so they put their money in everything. And you can do that quite easily these days through an exchange trade of fund. Secondly, that they get paralysis, so they do absolutely nothing and keep their money at the bank. Um, and then thirdly, sometimes they get tips from the people around them, so their family, friends, um, and, and get share tips. But I don't think any of that matters. I think the important thing is that you start because there's a psychology behind having skin in the game, which means you take an interest in it. And for me, investing is a complete journey, so you have to get started on that journey. There's no way that you're going to learn everything within a month or even a few months. This is a journey where you're probably going to accumulate um, knowledge over, over many years. So just getting started on that journey, buying something, 
means that you'll be checking the market more, you'll be interested in the market more and watching it more. And just with that, um, you'll be learning a lot more about the market. The other thing about just getting started is using time to help you on your investment journey. And this is a whole snowballing effect where you're using the power of time to do the work for you. Now, to, just to give you a really simple example, $10,000 invested today at 8% per annum, that would be about $20,000 in 10 years' time. In 20 years' time, that $10,000 would be $50,000. And in 50 years' time, that $10,000 would be worth more than half a million dollars. So it's really as much time in your investments together with the investment return. And that's the power of investing. And that's why starting young can be so powerful because you get a greater snowballing effect the older you get. So let's talk, we're going to talk about the power of the compounding returns from investing, Julia, because you raised such a great point. And a shout out to everyone letting me know in the chat and with private DMs, thank you. A few people admitting they've done a deep dive of their assets and the shoe, shoe collection is unsettlingly high in value. Uh, you're not alone. There's a few of you writing some DMs to me on that. Um, Louise, just quickly, Julia, Julia said, you know, it's quite easy to start investing with an exchange traded funds. For those of us who are new to some of these concept, concepts, Louise, what is an exchange traded fund, an ETF, and why is that an easy way to get started for people? So an exchange traded fund, you purchase on the stock exchange. So they're listed on the ASX. And why they're easy is because you can use your share trading platform. So Westpac Share Trading, Comsec, which provides a flat brokerage and no ongoing fees to provide you with broad-based exposure into an exchange-traded fund. And the underlying investments can be Australian shares, international shares, a diversified portfolio. So you, you're not making the decision to buy BHP or Westpac, depending on, on if you should, or, or a mining company that may or may not double overnight or what have you. So, you know, it gives you broad-based exposure. You're in the market. And what to Julia's point, once you're in the market, you take interest in it. So when you're watching the finance news, you say, oh, the market went, you know, the ASX 200 went up. I've, I've got that ASX 200 ETF. So I'm, I'm in that. Well, sometimes goes down and sideways. But, you know, over time, um, it gives you the opportunity to, to grow your assets at a really easy entry point. Yeah, it's a great, thank you so much for that explanation, Louise. I really appreciate it. So yeah, and Molly, I know that a big part of the work that you do with Ladies Finance Club is helping people get started. And thank you to everyone who's sending the questions through. Keep them coming. A lot of people are wanting to know, Molly, okay, they're here. And by the way, congratulations to everyone who's here today because that shows that you're taking a step of like educating yourself further and really prioritizing this in your life. So you should 100% give yourself a pack on, pat on the back for that. But Molly, people are sending me messages saying, like, what's a platform that I can use to get started? And how much should I invest in? And we can't give specific advice today, Molly, but I know that, you know, you have strategies and tactics that you help in general terms to help the people in your community. What's the best first step that you've seen? Yeah. So I think a really good place to start is like, first of all, working out, you know, why are you investing? Like, what's the point of it? Are you investing for the long term? Is there a certain goal? Um, is there like a house in six years time you want to invest in? Because we've got a couple of quick rules at Ladies Finance Club. And the first rule is um, you want to build your emergency fund first before you get started. You want to get rid of any high interest debt. So we're talking credit cards, buy now, pay later. It's really important. And why we say that is because the returns you'll make in the um, stock exchange might not be um, the returns you're making, like the, the same percentage that you're being charged on your credit card percent. So let's say you're getting charged 18% you're making 8% in the stock market. You can see that math there isn't working out. And then it's always money you don't need in the next kind of three to five years. So if you're wanting to buy a house next year, you wouldn't want to be investing that money. So once you've kind of ticked those three boxes, you know, a really, play, a really nice place to start is um, with, yeah, dipping your toe in the water. And with Ladies Finance Club, with our members, they always say, oh, I'm so scared that I'm going to invest my money and I'm going to lose it all. 
And that's why, you know, we're talking about exchange traded funds. And I always like to think of exchange traded funds um, like a box of mixed chocolates, like a box of mixed favorites. So, you know, you're not just getting all of Cherry Ripe or all of Mars Bar. You're getting a bit of Dream. You're getting a bit of dark chocolate, a bit of Time Out, a bit of Kit Kat. You're getting a whole mix of chocolates in the one unit. So that's the same like if you're buying, you know, an ASX 300, you're buying all the companies on the top 300 companies on their Australian market. So you're getting a bit of Telstra, a bit of BHP, a bit of NAB, a bit of Woolworths um, all in the one go. Um, so yeah, so I think a really nice first step is just dipping your toe in the water. Uh, there's a big misconception that you need heaps and heaps of money to invest. On most of these platforms, you can get started with $50. And I think a lot of women at Ladies Finance Club think it's gonna be thousands and thousands of dollars, but we're like, no, just take $50 and give that a go. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be all in straight away. So just to get yourself comfortable and understand what your risk profile is like. I feel like everyone's craving chocolate now, Molly. I'm now thinking about Kit Kats and Mars bars and like a Cadbury mixed box of chocolates. Um, but putting that to one side, I love that analogy that buying an exchange traded fund is kind of like getting a mixed box of bag of chocolates, right? You get a bit of a whole lot of different companies, which spreads that risk. And I want to talk about risk because there's a lot of questions of people coming through saying, I'd like to invest, but I'm scared. You know, you've obviously been watching the news, I'm sure, and you've seen that there's a, a large international um, crisis going on, which has affected the markets over the past couple of weeks. Um, you know, in Australia, there's been some challenges from a weather perspective, which is, you know, seen up and downs on the market as well. Julia, when we're looking at the news cycle, when we see these dips, when we see COVID impact the market in an extraordinarily large way, it puts fear uh, at the forefront for a lot of us. So can you talk a little bit about volatility and the highs and lows and what can we do as investors to sort of get around that? Is there a way that we can get around that volatility? Sure, I completely understand that question because there's been lots of studies that have been done and actually the pain of losing money is twice as bad as the pleasure of winning or gaining money. Um, so look, people are more scared of losing than making money. But in terms of investing, volatility, for me, it's something you have to embrace. It's something that you have to be comfortable with. And this is understanding your, your comfort factor. Are you comfortable with shares falling 10%, 20%? How much risk are you willing to take? Because if there was no volatility, and all volatility is things moving up and down, up and down, up and down. If shares didn't move up and down, up and down, up and down, you just wouldn't get the stronger returns from shares but basically they should just be returning cash. So it's that volatility and that up and down movement which provides or gives a reason uh, for these assets to um, give greater returns in the long run. So yeah, yes, there is risk, but you know, if we were in a risk-free investment like cash, we certainly wouldn't get the type of returns that we would investing in businesses. And at the end of the day, the share market is just a market full of businesses. There's good ones, there's bad ones. And as an investor, you're trying to pick the ones that are growing. So I want to talk about that. It's a, it's a really interesting point that you make there, Julia, that, you know, there, there is risk associated with investing, right? And if there was no risk, everyone would have all of their money in the market, right? But there is risk and it depends when you buy and when you sell as to whether you do make a profit like Julia did early in her investing journey. Or if to Molly's point, you need to buy a house tomorrow and you need to sell tomorrow, and the market's just taken a 30% dip, then that puts you in a really uncomfortable situation, right? So Louise, a question that I have for you is like micro investing. Can you talk us through how that works um, and whether that's a good step for people who are just getting started in their journey? Yeah, so micro investing is exactly that. Small amounts of money, preferably more often because otherwise it won't won't grow much over time. But as my English friends would say, take care of the pennies and the pounds will look after themselves. So micro investing, you could do as small as smaller um, amounts as $5. And you can do that by rounding up purchases. So going, you know, buying your $4 coffee, maybe rounding up to 10. Are you really gonna miss that $6 once a week, for example? 
So it's investing smaller amounts. So when you're investing those small amounts, you need to do it via a, a platform that allows you to invest smaller amounts. So as Julia said earlier, you know, if you're if you're investing on the ASX, you need a larger tranche. Um, and, and Molly suggested $50 is a good number. If you're investing less than that, generally there's fees that are associated, you know, a, a monthly administration fee. So it might be instead of investing those five. $5 tranches, you actually save that money. And when you get to the $500, then you add to your investment with a flat brokerage with no ongoing fee. So it's really important to understand the fees, but go with what works for you. So if the way you're going to stay focused and on track to meet your goal is to do the rounding up, do the smaller amounts more often, and that works for you and you're aware of the fees, then that's okay if that's how you're going to meet your goal more easily and stay interested in staying on track. Wonderful. That is such great advice. A small uh, amount to invest regularly really can add up um, to being a significant investment over a long period of time. Welcome to those of you who are still joining us. Thank you so much. My name is Maggie Palmer. I'm the founder of a company called Pep Talker. We're on a mission to close the gender pay gap and we are delighted to partner with Westpac's Ruby Connection on today's session on Investing 101. Molly, I know that a big part of your education thesis when you're supporting your community of women with Ladies Finance Club to start investing, to move through the fear that sometimes a lot of us have around investing is to automate and to set and forget, which, you know, at least to start with, to kind of get something something started. Molly, can you talk us through that and how that's really powerful? Because there's a lot of questions about when do I sell? When do I worry about tax? What do I do? But sometimes people are so concerned about that, they forget to just get started in the first instance. Yeah, absolutely. So um, that's a question we get all the time. Like, when is the best time to invest? And it's kind of like, do we have magic vision balls? But a really good place um, to start for those people is something called dollar cost averaging. So it's when you're investing the same amount of money into your investments, whether that be ETF shares or funds um, over regular um, intervals of time. And when you put your investments on automation, so you know that is just coming out of your bank account and being invested straight into the market, um, automatically, that is that set and forget. You don't even have to think about it. You're literally sleeping and, uh, you know, like you can be sleeping, not even thinking about it. And your money is automatically being invested into the market without you physically having to do it. So it's just kind of like a really convenient thing to set up, um, you know, like your bills go out, your investments go out. So that is a one way of doing it, you know? And I love that I'm um, saying, I think it's the guy, um, Jack Bogle, who started Vanguard. He says, don't try and pick the needle in the hand haystack buy the whole haystack. And so with um, investing, if, uh, like something I hear quite common is like, but what if I pick a company and all my money goes into that company and the company goes broke? Kind of like think about Blockbuster Video. Had you put all your money into Blockbuster Video, it went down. Again, that's why, you know, we like to diversify and spread our risk out. And so when we have that automation happening and that is going into, let's say like an exchange traded fund and that money is being automatically spread across hundreds, sometimes even thousands of different companies in the one go. And you're not even having to pick like what's the best pharmaceutical in Japan or what shopping center in Germany is going well. It's just all automatically happening for you. Yeah, the, the automation piece is really helpful, isn't it, Molly? And that's something that actually I set up um, a few years ago was to automate at least something every month going out so that, to Molly's point, I could take advantage of that dollar cost averaging. Sometimes I was probably buying at the top of the market and sometimes I was buying during the pandemic or the, the system in the back end was buying for me during the pandemic even when the market was crashing. I felt a little bit sick um, because I knew that the market was going down. But if we look at the market over the long term, Julia, like if we take, if, if we look at the market today and think, oh my gosh, it's dropped 6%. Oh my gosh, it's up 3%. Do I sell? That's scary. But if we pull back and think, well, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, we see the market trend in one direction typically. Can you talk, Julia, about that and also the power of dividends as part of that longer term investing strategy? 
Oh, so I guess when we, we look across the market, it does move in cycles. At the moment, we're just 1% away from an all-time record high for the Australian share market. So it's actually quite an exciting time. So despite the pandemic and all we've been through through the last couple of years, the market's almost at an all-time record high and still the economy is bouncing back from our COVID. We're starting to go out again, starting to go shopping again, starting to eat at restaurants and go to bars and clubs again. So all that activity has been positive for a lot of businesses um, in terms of the market. And, you know, the market does go through cycle. I've come to expect that in a, an eight to 10 year period, you see at least sort of one market crash. And a market crash for me is a fall of sort of 20, 30 or 40 percent. Um, if you're going through it for the first time, it's extremely scary. And even if you've been through it a few times, it's extremely scary as, as well. But once you've experienced a few, I guess you come to know that, you know, that's not going to last forever. And that's one of the things I always ask myself when I'm questioning investing in the market. Is the situation now going to last forever? Is this market crash going to be continual and last forever? Well, it can't because economies keep on going and people keep on going, living their lives, businesses rebuild. So if it's not going to last forever, then it's fine because it's just part of the market cycle. So, you know, if you can invest more at those times when everyone's panicking and fearful, um, that could be a, a good long-term strategy. I mean, um, I, I guess um, I, I was speaking to a real estate agent the other day and he said it well. And he said, in your lifetime, if you could buy every time there was a market crash in the property market and everyone was so scared and sell near the top of the market and just do that a few times in your lifetime with probably what's most people's biggest asset, their house, then you know you'd be set for retirement and you'd be set for life. And you can think of it in the same way in terms of the share market. If you could try and buy more when the market's bottoming out or looking quite relatively cheap and, and look at perhaps, you know, selling or um, just putting in your normal amount near the top, then over a period of time, you know, that's all going to accumulate. So it's just understanding that the market does move in cycles, just like the business cycle and the economic cycle, even relationship cycles and our life cycle. Um, then I think, you know, it's it's just about embracing that as part of your strategy rather than being too scared of it. The and highs and lows. Yeah, go ahead, always, Louise. Jump in. Sorry, Maggie. You can't always, you know, time the market. So the next best thing is to, to dollar cost average, to average in your, your, your purchase price and also make sure you have the, the appropriate time frame. So... When you think about investing, what's your goal and what's the time frame for meeting that goal? So if you're investing for secondary school education, then you've got, and your child's two, you might have a 10 year time frame. Or if you wanna add more money into super, you know, super doesn't finish when you retire, it goes on for the rest of your life. So it might be a 40 year time frame. So it's about determining your time frame and making sure you're investing appropriately um, for the time frame. That's a great, that's a great point, Louise. And we had that question coming through. Someone said, I want to buy a house in the next six months. Should I invest now? You should consult a professional, but you should also consider the fact that if you're going to need access to that money quite quickly, then maybe that's not a level of risk you're willing to take on right now, right? You've got to think about that. Maybe you want to put a very small amount in that $50 a month, something like that, that you're happy to lose in the short term or see go up and down in the short term and keep that bigger chunk of your house deposit if you definitely know you're going to need that to purchase a house. So it's a hard thing to weigh up, isn't it? Um, but a lot of people asking specifically about platforms. Yes, this session is being recorded. Yes, we will send you some more resources afterwards. And yes, we probably will do a follow-up session because I don't think we're going to cover everything today. Um, but Molly, just quickly, I know we can rattle off a bunch of, a couple of platforms. Westpac's got a great investing platform. There's robo-advisors like Stocks, but I know you've got some others that you really like as well. Yeah, absolutely. And the big thing I say with um, some of the platforms is like it, they all do the same thing. So if you're buying a lipstick, whether you buy it from Priceline, Sephora, Mecca, you're going to end up with a lipstick. It's kind of similar to some of these different um, uh, products. So a couple of, and these are not recommendations. These are just what is popular in my community. I surveyed them um, a week and a half ago. So this is coming out of them. So on the, ro on the micro app investing side, Spaceship Rays are quite popular. And then on the broker side, Comsec, Perla, Self Wealth, Superhero Stake, um, Vanguard, Personal Investor, and Westpac's platform as well. 
So there's a lot of different platforms to Molly's point and there's some great staff um, in the Westpac branches on the website as well that you can go to and reach out to. There's some great resources on Westpac's Ruby Connection website as well that we will circulate to you afterwards. That's got a lot of resources that can really help you. Some people are asking, we're unfortunately at time, so we're going to have to wrap things up. But just quickly, I want to go around the room um, around the Zoom room um, for one final tip from our amazing panelists, um, specifically when you're investing, what is the most important thing to you? Because a lot of people have been asking about ethical investing. We're going to run an entire session on that later in the year. Um, but Julia, people here are saying, can you, can you intentionally invest in ethical ETFs if you are looking to buy an exchange traded fund and stick to your values? Is that possible? Yeah, I mean, we, we call it environmental, social and governments. We're, we're looking at environmental factors, social factors, and also how the company is being governed. And for me, this is about looking at the risk side of the business and the risk side of investing. So you don't get these big minefields blowing up while you're investing. And certainly uh, there are uh, ESG focus or ethically focused products out there, and they just add an extra layer of, I guess, looking at the risk factors uh, through those three lenses. Um, there's been a number of studies that have been done that over a longer term that you do see superior returns. And it's easy to see why. If you're managing the risk, for me, a lot of um, making money is about keeping your money, so capital preservation. And that means thinking about risk on the ESG side. So I'm um, definitely on the ethical, the environmental, the social governance. The other thing is that a lot of money is flowing into that area, not only because individuals want their investing to reflect their values, and we call it value-based investing, but also on an institutional level as well as a government level, these factors are becoming very important, especially as yep. the world moves towards zero carbon. Yeah, exactly. And so there's a lot of options out here to, Julia, to, to, to Julia's point. There's more ETS than you could imagine, more different funds that are investing in specific types of stocks. Um, so when you start researching it, you will be fascinated to see just how many options are available to you. Louise, just quickly to wrap us up, what's the one thing that you would like people to think about after today's session when they're considering making their next investment? I would like them to consider why they're investing. So why do it? So it's usually to achieve a goal. And a goal should be smart goal. So specific, measurable, uh, achievable, realistic and time bound. And that will help you then determine what investment is right for you. Great advice. Think about what is your why? Why are you investing? For me, my why is compounding interest and compounding growth. Molly, what's your one tip that you would love everyone to take away from today? Uh, I'm jumping on the um, ethical bandwagon. So I think it's incredible. Like your money has power and where you choose to invest that money really has an impact on the world. So definitely make sure you're looking at, you know, where is that money going that you're investing it in? Look at, there's a huge range of um, ethical ETFs out there and really make sure as well, you're looking at the fees as well. We haven't gotten too much into fees, but fees matter. Fees can really eat into profit. So make sure you at least look at the fees and a great um, website is marketindex.com. They also have some really good information about all the ETFs in Australia that are available on the ASX. So many gems. Thank you so much, Julia, Molly and Louise. We are just um, delighted to have heard from your incredible expertise today. Thank you for sharing with us. And thank you to everyone for showing up today. It takes courage to ask questions. There's been hundreds of them coming through. So we will be doing a follow-up session. Do not worry. We will be sending you a recording. We will send you a heap of resources. Jump on rubyconnection.com.au as well. There are some amazing resources there to really step you through this process. Um, so many good pieces of advice. Put your money um, where your mouth is, to Molly's point, when you're thinking about investing ethically. The power of compounding interest uh, and taking, you know, a zoom out longer term approach and the dollar cost averaging point that you made, Louise, I think is, is super valuable as well. Really appreciate your insights and start somewhere, right? Start with an amount that you're happy to lose. Maybe it's two bucks, maybe it's five bucks, um, a small amount, and you will become more interested in learning, reading and listening to investment podcasts hearing from Julia on the news and different outlets where you'll see her friendly face popping up left, right and centre now that you've met her on today's session as well. So thank you for sharing your advice. We so appreciate you. And thank you to Ruby Connection for hosting us today. Um, Amber um, from the Westpac team and also Kira, who a lot of you know, Kira McClelland, 
from Westpac's Ruby Connection really spearheaded this Lunch and Learn series. Today is unfortunately her last day. Um, she has some very exciting new adventures that she's going to. So we're going to embarrass her by saying thank you, Kira, um, for all your support of really investing in women and their education around financial literacy and financial freedom, which is what we want for all of you. So a huge thank you to Kira for all your leadership and advocacy in this space. We appreciate you, we value you, and we are excited to see what your next steps are in the financial literacy world. Thank you for all of your support. Uh, and thank you to all of you for joining us today. We appreciate you and we will see you at next month's Westpac Ruby Connection Lunch and Learn. Thank you and good luck, Kira. Farewell. <laughs> Thanks everyone, take care.